that such experiments are conducted, the experiments you will hear described are and did undoubtedly cause suffering to the animals concerned. However, in the cause of this test for a new eyeshadow, the relevant clause in the law does not forbid causing suffering, but causing unnecessary suffering. And that is what you have to decide. Was the suffering unnecessary? Now, the prosecution who are bringing this case, that is to say the movement for the protection of laboratory animals, say that it was unnecessary, and we shall bring evidence to that effect. I call Sarah Stevens. Dr. William Ranford and James Meatham, directors of a cosmetics firm, are charged by the movement for the protection of laboratory animals with conspiring to cause unnecessary suffering to experimental animals in their laboratories. A mistake in a Home Office licence has allowed this prosecution to be brought as a test case. The jury in this trial has been selected from members of the public, whose names appear on the electoral register and who are eligible for jury service. Is your full name Sarah Stevens, and do you live at flat 9A, 42 Marlowe's Gardens, London, and do you work as a chemist at Animal Free Cosmetics of London? Yes, that is right. Mrs. Stevens, were you present as a visitor at the laboratories of Vanguard Cosmetics of Finlay near Fulchester on October the 14th, 1974? I was. What did you see there? I saw Dr. Ranford, the one in the brown suit, torturing some animals. Mrs. Stevens, it would be of assistance to us all if you avoided using emotive words. Now, what was Dr. Ranford actually doing? He was forcing a liquid mercury compound into some rats with a hypodermic syringe. Mm -hmm. He was also deliberately blinding rabbits with the mercury. If you bring me a rabbit, I can show you what he was doing. Mr. James. Are we to see the actual experiments, Mrs. Merritt? Is that really necessary? Uh, my lord, the witness will show how the experiment was done, but will not perform it. Nothing will actually happen to the animals. Very well. My lord, the rabbit will be exhibit one, and the accompanying eyedropper will be exhibit two. Very well. <laughs> I'm afraid it won't balance on the edge. If it's all right, I'll put it on the table. Yes, yes. If you could just hold the rabbit. Ranford had a dropper like this, and he was dribbling the mercury solution from it into the rabbit's eyes and blinding them. He pulled down the eyelid like this, and put the solution in with the dropper. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, Mrs. Stevens, what did the rabbits do during this part of the experiment? They were screaming and kicking. I saw one of them afterwards with red eyes, kind of blanked out. It was blind. Shall I show you what he did to the rats? If the court has no objection, I think it would be of value. Mr. James, would you be so kind as to remove the rabbit and bring over the rats? <coughs> My lord, uh, the rats will be exhibit three, and the hypodermic syringe with catheter will be exhibit four. Very well. Now, Mrs. Merritt, Mr. Ellis, I am allowing these demonstrations because the jury does need to know what the experiments actually look like. Though, why you couldn't do it by means of photographs, I have no idea. You know, there's no surer way of poisoning the springs of justice than by using a criminal court as a theatre. And that I will not allow. Now, proceed. Thank you, my lord. Yes, Mrs. Stevens. I shan't need you for this. There we are. Ranford had a hypodermic syringe like this, which he was pushing down into their stomachs. I could show you how, but it would hurt him. It goes into the mouth, down the esophagus, into the stomach. He was trying to kill them to see how much of the mercury solution it took. Well, it took the most enormous doses, I should say up to one-tenth of the body weight. The rats were in the most awful pain. They were scrabbling and fighting, paddling with their feet as he forced it in. I've never seen a more revolting sight in my life. They just died because of the sheer volume that he was pushing in. Mrs. Stevens, thank you. Mr. James, would you remove the rats and the rest of the equipment? Now, uh, Mrs. Stevens. Oh, do you want me to go back in there? Uh, if you would, thank you. Mrs. Stevens, you're a person with experience of the cosmetics trade. Was the suffering caused in these experiments necessary? No, they're barbaric and disgusting. The rat one is so repellent that most reputable scientists refuse to carry it out. The rabbit one is a particularly fiendish way of depriving an animal of its sight, slowly, with the maximum of pain. You can easily produce cosmetics without doing any of these tests. 
if you use natural products and human volunteers, which is what my firm does, and has done for ten years. Mrs. Stevens, thank you. Mrs. Stevens, <clears throat> perhaps you would tell the court how a person with your strongly held views on animal experimentation came to be in Dr. Ranford's laboratory at all when he was doing these experiments. He invited me. He sent round a circular to people in the industry telling everyone what marvellous products he was making. I thought I'd go and have a look. Do you think he knew you had these extreme views? Oh, I don't know. He didn't ask me what I thought about his goings-on. And you didn't tell him? Certainly not. You kept it secret? Well, like I kept it a secret that I have two children. He didn't ask and I didn't tell him. Well, there are clearly two views on whether you should have remained on the premises since you were, to say the very least, in a false position. Still, let us move on. Now, how long have you been on the uh, anti-animal testing bandwagon? Ever since I was at university and saw what they got up to in the biochemistry labs. Mm -hmm. And what is the main focus of your campaign this year? Oh, cosmetics. The revolting way in which many artificial so-called beauty products like eyeshadow are tested on animals before being put on the market. And what do you urge people to do? Oh, to boycott all such products. We just try to make people realize that by buying such products, they're conniving at and being implicated in those animal tests. If you buy an animal-tested product, some of that animal's pain rubs off on you. I see. So you urge people to boycott the product because it is tested in a manner in which you disapprove? Yes. Mm -hmm. I see. So we may assume that you are not now in court wearing anything that has been tested on an animal? Yes. I take great care over that. All of us in the movement do. Oh, good. Now, what do you think about the testing of drugs, medical preparations and household goods that are on sale to the general public? Well... On genuinely valuable drugs, most of us would accept that they must be tested first, usually by chemical means, but if necessary, on animals, to make sure that there are no side effects. But new, so-called consumer goods are different. We think that most of those aren't necessary anyway. I mean, things like new washing powders, new colorings for food and such like. Most of those are just sold so as to look like something new. Yes, you believe it is wrong to test such household products on animals. Yes, there are other ways to test products. Mm, so obviously you don't use such products yourself. Well, not if I can help it. I see. Now, let us look at um, number 9A Marlowe's Gardens, where you live. Now, is there a kitchen there? Yes, a small one. Yes, very well. Let us face the draining board. What stands on it? Plate rack, wire wool, detergent. Did you know that detergent was sometimes tested on animals? to make sure it was safe in case people swallowed it? Yes, I did. All of us in the movement have had to argue about this kind of thing, but we had a petition about detergent along with some other things about a year ago. Yes, you knew it was tested on animals and yet you use it. Why? Well, we have decided to boycott only luxuries and we think that detergent is not a luxury. It is a personal decision. We take it. I see. Eyeshadow is a luxury, detergent is not. Well, that may seem to some a rather Fine distinction? Well, you just have to draw the line somewhere, that's all. Indeed. Do you use um, floor polish? Not usually. I sometimes shine up the floor when I have people in. I use it then. There is no real substitute. Now then, food wrapping paper. Do you boycott that? No, I use that. You can hardly buy stuff that's not wrapped in artificial wrapping paper of some kind. Did you know that floor polish and wrapping paper were sometimes tested on animals. Yes, I did. It is just one of the compromises that one has to make if one wishes to run a home properly. Yeah. Now, when you feed your children, do you offer them strawberry jam with artificial colorants in it? No. <laughs> Go to the health food shop. I think it tastes nicer. Anyway, it is a luxury, so I would boycott it. I see. So detergent and floor polish and wrapping paper are in the view of your movement Essentials and a strawberry jam and eyeshadow are luxuries, is that right? More or less. Mm -hmm. And the reason you are prosecuting Dr. Ranford rather than the people who may have tested your own detergent, floor polish and wrapping paper is that Dr. Ranford was helping to produce a luxury and they, in their, your view, were not. More or less, yes. But like I said, 
You just have to draw the line somewhere, and that is where I draw it. Yes. Mrs. Stevens, tell me one thing. In an area which is so full of shifting sands, so to speak, if you can claim that floor polish is essential, can't my clients legitimately claim that eye shadow is essential? No. I think it's just ludicrous to call eye shadow an essential. Any more ludicrous than calling floor polish an essential? I'm not saying that the distinction is easy to make. It is just a decision that we all have to come to one way or another, that's all. Nevertheless, it is a highly personal decision. Yes, of course it is. Yes. Mrs. Stevens, thank you. Dr. McKernan, you are a general medical practitioner and also general secretary of the Movement for the Protection of Laboratory Animals, who is bringing this prosecution. Yes, I am. Did you, on November the 15th, 1974, visit Dr. Ranford at his laboratories near Fulchester? Yes, I did. I went to see him at the request of Mrs. Stevens, a long-standing member of our movement. She had reported certain rather alarming experiments to me. As a medical practitioner, I was able to talk to Dr. Ranford on a common professional basis. He agreed that he had been carrying out certain rather distressing tests on laboratory animals, in particular the Dray's eye test, so-called test. Dr. McKernan, did he agree that they were distressing? And if so, distressing to whom? To the animals or to the observers of the experiment? Well, he agreed they had caused pain, my lord. Yes, I see. Thank you. Now, he also agreed after some humming and hawing, that he'd been carrying out the test known as the LD-50 on rats. What is that? Ah, the LD-50. May I say at once how pleased I am to be the first to expose this uh, experiment before a British court. The LD-50, my lord, is uh, a Dr. test... Dr. McKernan, would you please speak so that the jury can hear you? I'm so sorry. I do apologise. The LD-50 is a test which gives a lethal dose to 50% of the animals on the test. Hence the initials L for lethal, D for dose, 50 for 50%. Now the LD-50 is a test to establish what quantity of a substance, be it eyeshadow or arsenic or even water, kills. Because of course even water can kill if you give enough of it. It cannot be completed, cannot, until half the animals on the test are dead. Now, dead, not ill, not distressed, but dead. Suppose they do not die, Dr. McKernan. My lord, uh, if I may say so, you have touched upon the heart of the matter with great judiciousness. The answer is you simply go on until they do die. I see, thank you. Now, why must they be dead? Why on earth do those people who carry out these experiments go for the kill? In fact, what they need to find out is how much of the eyeshadow, for example, might make someone ill. A child, perhaps, who takes some by accident from a bathroom shelf. Now, one moment, Dr. McKernan. Uh, do children, in fact, become ill through swallowing eyeshadow? Rarely, my lord. Perfume and uh, nail varnish removal are normally the products implicated. Yeah. So the LD50 is, in fact, a test which provides information we do not need to know. If I may quote from Food and Cosmetic Toxicology, Volume 8, 1970, page 214. The author says, The widespread use of the LD50 is unfortunate. Unfortunate. And goes on to say, we need to know the lowest dosage level which damages organs, not the completely irrelevant overdosage that the LD50 represents. Irrelevant, yes. Now, just remind us again why the level at which death occurs in an LD50 for eyeshadow uh, is an irrelevant piece of information. Of course, my lord, you would ban the eyeshadow from the market as soon as you found it caused damage. Yes, thank you. You would not need to know what uh, level of it killed. It is irrelevant. Please go on. So, the completely <coughs> irrelevant overdose. <coughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, this, uh, these words were used of this test 
1970. Yet in 1974, Dr. Ranford is still discovered to be using it. Ladies and gentlemen, my lord, I put it to you that the LD50 is not science. It is a meat axe. You mean um, a crude and harsh measure of possible harmfulness when what is needed is some more subtle and informative test. That is it exactly, my lord. Yes. Now, as to the second test seen by... Uh, Mrs. Stevens, the Dre's eye test used in this case to test eyeshadow. Wow. It is open to one simple crushing objection. It risks blinding the rabbit. And in this case, did so. Well, you can do without your eyeshadow. The rabbit cannot do without its eyes. Full stop. End of argument. So, Dr. McKernan, you believe that the Dre's test and the LD50 are cruel and unnecessary, and I that in any case, no animal should suffer merely to produce luxuries for humans. I do. Thank you, Dr. McKernan. Dr. McKernan, <clears throat> my client, Dr. Ransford, will offer a detailed scientific rebuttal of your case against the LD50 when he comes to give his evidence. It uh, is his field of expertise. But first I want to ask you a little about more general issues. Now, how long have you been General Secretary of the Movement for the Protection of Laboratory Animals? Four years. And before that? I was Chief Coordinator of the Committee to Combat Animal Testing. Yes, there was a doctrinal dispute which led to the setting up of this new movement as a separate organization, I believe. On a matter of principle, yes. Mm -hmm. And what was that? Principle. Uh, I was and remain totally opposed to all experiments on any kind of living animal. For any purpose? Including the production of, say, uh, new drugs? Yes. Hmm. Was it you, uh, Dr. McKernan, who wrote in the uh, New Movement's newsletter of April 1975, I see no reason for believing that man's life is of more value than that of any other species? Yes, it was, yes. And is that still your view? Oh, yes. And also, we must fight to the end against so-called medical testing. We will never betray our trust. Yes, that is my belief. It shows the fate of many revolutionary ideas in being unpopular. You actually believe that no experiments of any kind should ever be carried out on a living animal, even, for example, to find a cure for a disease? Yes, I do. Well, you do know that tens of thousands of experiments are carried out each year in animals in Britain to find a cure for cancer. Oh, yes, I know. But you see, when you actually look more closely at cancer, you find that it is largely brought about by man's own pollution of what he eats, of what he smokes, of his own environment. So I would ask, can we legitimately sacrifice another species to save ourselves from what is, in effect, a self-inflicted wound? What about experiments aimed at finding a cure for heart disease? Oh, yes. Well, then, again, when you actually look at it, you find that heart disease is an affliction of an over-civilized, over-urbanized society. <laughs> now, if we really want to reduce heart disease, we should cut down on our intake of animal fats. Oh, I see. Now, this is strange territory, Dr. McKernan. You come here, a medical practitioner as a witness on scientific matters, and yet you turn your back on the accepted techniques of modern medicine. I believe that the eternal verities of right and wrong are much more important than any passing scientific fashions. Well, Dr. McKernan, if you went outside this court, stopped any passerby and argued that there should be no experimentation on animals for cancer research, what would he say? Well, unless he were one... <laughs> One of a very small band of enthusiasts, he would probably disagree, but that would not be unusual. Any new idea requires careful seeding and preparation before it flowers. Well, it's surely not so much a new idea, Dr. McKernan, as the total destruction of a cornerstone in modern medicine. Oh, yes. But slavery in its time was often described as one of the cornerstones of the British Empire. But it was wrong, morally wrong. And because it was wrong, it eventually perished. Yes, well, if you can turn from the 19th century to the present, Doctor, was it you who wrote, how can we say that the dolphin is superior to man or man to the dolphin? Yes, it was. 
and did you also right? until we have a common standard of justice for man, mouse, and moor hen, then we have no justice at all worth the name. Yes, I did, if I may, my lord. You see, justice is not a matter of barristers or wigs or gowns. It is a principle. And as such, it cannot be appropriated by a single species. It is for all or for none. Well, did you also write Say what you like about the so-called creepy crawlies. For me, the gastropod is a model of ecological sanity. If you see me one day doffing my hat at the garden rubbish dump, you will know that I am paying my respects to a passing snail. Now, is that you? No. That is one of our wilder contributors. You get uh, many strange people in any animal protection movement. I should have thought you would have recognized it wasn't my style. What about, until biologists treat bacteria with the respect due to another living species, they cannot expect the bacteria will cooperate. Now, is that one of yours? Oh, indeed, yes. If you look at the evidence from the East on such things as fire walking, there is a strong suggestion that even quite small organisms, conceivably those in the soles of our feet, respond startlingly to mental forces. Now, there is an area that I would seek to know more about. Dr. McKernan, let me put one thing to you quite bluntly. If your admitted views on the ethics of testing are as eccentric as you agree they are, what is your scientific opinion of the LD50 worth? You don't need to be a scientist to know that the LD50 is a barbarity. All you need is a spark of humanity. And as for my views being eccentric, Christianity was eccentric when it first came in. They used to throw its practitioners to the lions in the Colosseum, you know. Now, if you have arguments rather than ill-judged attempts at ridicule, let us hear them. Why, in fact, do you think that man is a master race entitled to torture and degrade animals as he will? Where is the logic in it? Dr. McKernan, I think most people would say it was common sense that a oh. snail's life was less valuable than a human being's. Common sense? It was common sense once that men were born free men and slaves. It was common sense that children should work down coal mines. It was common sense that unmarried mothers should be hounded out of society. Common sense. Where's your humanity? Oh, Dr. McKernan, it is for counsel to ask questions. My lord. I have nothing further, my lord. Uh, Dr. McKernan, just to clear up one or two points. It is your personal view that all testing on animals should cease? On living animals, yes. Uh, but you're not now seeking to convince the jury of that, but of some less sweeping proposal, are you not? Yes. What is it? Ah that the testing of this particular eyeshadow ingredient in this way was unnecessary. Why? Yes, because while animal testing on certain products can only be avoided by major changes in our society, animal testing on eyeshadow can easily be avoided either by using naturally produced makeup, testing on humans, or preferably, in my view, though this is only personal, by using none at all. Thank you, Dr. McKernan. My lord, that is the case for the prosecution. The cases in Fulchester are fictitious. Join us tomorrow when the movement for the protection of laboratory animals versus Ranford and Meatham will be resumed in the Crown Court.
Dr. William Renford and James Meatham, directors of a cosmetics firm, are charged by the movement for the protection of laboratory animals with conspiring to cause unnecessary suffering to experimental animals in their laboratories. A mistake in a Home Office licence has allowed this prosecution to be brought as a test case. The jury in this trial has been selected from members of the public, whose names appeared on the electoral register and who are eligible for jury service. At the start of the second day of the trial, Dr. William Ranford is about to give evidence. Uh, my Lord, I, uh, I find myself today in some difficulty when opening my case, owing to the disappearance of certain exhibits in the course of last night. Uh, my Lord, early this morning my client, Dr. Ranford, received a message from a junior member of his staff, a Miss Jenkins, who had been entrusted overnight with the care of two animals and a flask of mercury, uh, which were to have been exhibits in today's proceedings. My Lord, Miss Jenkins alleged that she was in some distress at the evidence about animal experimentation given in this court yesterday, and in her own words had seen fit to um, liberate the animals, which uh, consisted of a rabbit and a rat in a field near Mottram St. Andrew. And she said she would be giving a press conference in the uh, pot Shrigley Motel and would give herself up to the police there. Uh, well, can't we get on without these distractions? The authorities will deal with this matter in due course. Can you proceed without these exhibits? Well, my Lord, we can. Well, then, let's get on. Uh, my Lord, there remains the matter of the flask of mercury, which must, in no circumstances, be allowed to get into the public water supply. Mr. Jenkins has it with her. Well, I have no jurisdiction to deal with that. These things were not actually made exhibits. You'd better ask the police, the police, to proceed at once to the uh, Pot Shrigley Motel and there seize Miss Jenkins and her flask of mercury. Certainly, my lord. You deal with that. Now then, let's get on. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Ranford, do you challenge the account of your experiments given to this court by Mrs. Stevens? Yes. I would say that her feelings for animals led her to distort what she saw beyond all recognition. To take just one example, only one rabbit was blinded and in one eye only, and it was quickly destroyed. What Mrs. Stevens saw on that particular occasion was a bactericidal compound containing mercury passing through a standard Dray screening test. Now, the test did, in fact, detect a substance which was irritant to the cornea of the eye. Now, you'll appreciate that the whole point of such screening tests is, in fact, to detect such substances. There was also the LD50... Dr. Ranford, if I may intervene there for some explanations. Now, a bactericidal compound is what? In lay terms, it's a mixture of substances designed to kill bacteria. And the cornea... The horny, transparent covering of the eyeball. Thank you. And a screening test <laughs> for the sake of the jury, Dr. Ranford. A screening test is a test to detect and eliminate substances harmful to humans before a product is made generally available. If I may, Mr. Ellis, it is a, a precautionary check. Yes. It's a term widely used around about the time of the disastrous thalidomide affair, which you yes. may recall. Thank you. There have been other alarms, but they haven't received quite so much publicity. Finacetin and Eraldin. The side effects can be very nasty. Yes. Now, Dr. Granford, there has been some criticism in this courtroom of the particular screening test you used. Now, what was that? Yes, well, I'd like to take the so-called LD-50 first. Now, as we've heard, L stands for lethal, D for dose, and 50 for 50%. This is a test generally carried out on rats to see how much of a substance kills half a batch of test animals, usually 12. And we take half in order to iron out any individual peculiarities that any particular animal might have, like being particularly sensitive to a substance. The idea being that if you took fewer than 12, you might get a false impression of how poisonous the substance was because you were using too few animals. Yes. I see. Thank you. Well, there has been criticism of this test along the lines suggested by Dr. McKernan, uh, but it has the approval of the Home Office in this country, and internationally it has the say-so of the World Health Organization, and it's considered obligatory in some cases by officials of the Food and Drug Administration in the United States where this particular product was going. In fact, that was why we were doing it, although we would probably also have done it for the British market. 
The American authorities insisted on it, but the British might have also had it been intended for the British market. Yes, they certainly approve of its being used, but we would probably also have done it to be on the safe side. I see, probably, but not certainly. Hmm? Yes, go on. Well, the point I'm driving at is this, my lord, that if you convict Mr. Meatham and myself on this charge, you're going to have to dismantle an entire network of governmental and intergovernmental safety procedures. Still, that's your business. Now, Dr. Ranford, it is the jury who will convict or acquit you, not I. I'm sorry, my lord. I'd like to return to the LD50, if I may, as it is central to the whole system. Now, around the world today, there are all sorts of scientists operating, good, bad, and indifferent, some very indifferent. Each tends to assess things in his own way. They all have their own private theories about how much of what causes what and why. Now, some people think that drowsiness on the part of an animal is a sure sign of a liver complaint. Someone else thinks it's bound to be a minor defect of the central nervous system. Nobody knows what is right. But death is death. Knowing for sure the precise amount of a substance that kills a particular species of animal is a secure point of reference, proof against any error of interpretation by anyone. That is the great value of the LD50. Thank you. Now then, Dr. Ranford, let us turn to the eye test on the rabbits. Ah, yes, the drays. Well, this has also been around the world, although it started off in the United States for reasons which I should be glad to explain. In fact, when it became known that I was to be charged with conducting this test, I had several volunteers from the United States to offer to give evidence in my favour. In fact, I had hoped they might be allowed as witnesses. Your Lord, Honour, I... many years ago, when I was a resident of Kent... No, sit down, sir. Sit down. This court is not a theatre. Dr. Ranford, I take an extremely poor view of anybody who tries to stage things in my court. There must be no more of this. Well, uh, I'm sorry, my lord, that was not intentional. The fact is that during the 1930s, uh, before eye irritation tests such as the one I was conducting were introduced, uh, people in the United States, like Mr. Vandenberg, were blinded by using shampoos based on detergents of a type known as cationic. I expect you know that shampoos are based on detergents. Well, these detergents proved unexpectedly damaging to the eye. Now, the eye test that I was conducting, the rabbit eye test, known as the Drays after its inventor, is used as a safety screen to ensure that products such as eye makeup and shampoo are unlikely to cause damage of this kind. Dr. Randman, is it usual for the eye test to cause pain to the experimental animal? Well, it all depends what it is you're testing. If it is, in fact, harmless, then probably not. But if there is a risk to humans, then it may also hurt the animal. In fact, one of the compounds I was testing when Mrs. Stevens came in on her little expedition did, in fact, contain an ingredient which was capable of causing damage to the eye. Well, fortunately, it was caught by the test. But if it had not been, we might have had other cases of blindness on our hands. I mean, we're, we're dealing with a very difficult compound. I make no excuses for preventing such disasters, but I, I must say I do get very irritated at having to waste day after day explaining the basic rules of preventive medicine to laymen totally unfamiliar with the scientific method. Dr. Ranford, I'm not sure whether you're aware of it, but you give the impression of being extremely condescending to the jury. If there's anything you find you can't explain simply, please ask my advice. I will, my lord. Dr. Ranford, and no doubt some members of the jury may be asking themselves whether human volunteers could not have been used in experiments of this kind. Not when the substance was potentially toxic, as it was in this case. Let us have that quite clear. You are fully aware, you say, that the eyeshadow ingredient you were testing might, in certain circumstances, cause harm. Yes, the toxic ingredient in our particular brand of eye makeup was a compound of mercury. Now, mercury is not normally used in makeup or in cosmetics of any kind because of its poisonous properties. But there is one exception. The human skin acts as host to countless millions of bacteria of a type known as pseudomonas. Now, th would you like me to spell that? No, thank you, Dr. Ranford. Proceed. The pseudomonas also live in the intestine, the sinus, and the feces. They also infect dogs. Now, if you get them in your eye, 
and the body's natural defences for some reason fail, then you can be blinded. In fact, one of the people who'd volunteered to give evidence on my behalf was blinded by this infection. Mr Ellis, are there any more of these unfortunate people scattered about my courtroom? Not so far as I'm aware, my lord. Good. Proceed, Dr Randman. Now, Pseudomonas bacteria are particularly resistant to nearly all bactericides with the exception of mercury. Now, it is for this reason that mercury compounds are specifically permitted in eye makeup in the United States and in the common market as bacteria killers. Now, it is these mercury compounds that we were testing. Yes. Now, Dr. Ranford, I think that Lehman may have got a little left behind. Now, what of these bacteria to do with eyeshadow? Eyeshadow, when applied to the eyelid, is a very fertile breeding ground for these bacteria. I see. So you are saying that the animals, or some of them, did suffer pain, but this was in the cause of weeding out a potentially dangerous compound. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Rand. Dr. Ranford, can you tell us something about your company? How large is it? We employ 30 people, including myself and Mr. Meatham. Last year, we had a turnover of around 400,000 pounds. Yes, I think the firm made a loss of 20,000 pounds last year and 30,000 the year before. Well, that's not unusual in the early years of a company's existence. How long have you been going? Four years. Mm. Now, your last annual report says you employed 40 people, not 30. How is that? Well, we've made economies. I've become chief chemist as well as managing director, and Mr. Meatham, the marketing manager, has also taken more on his shoulders. Well, certainly round the corner. Which corner is that? The corner involved in setting up a new firm on one's own. Cosmetic supplying is a highly competitive business. Now, where had you and Mr. Meatham worked together before? At the British branch of AFSID in New York, the International Drugs House. I was assistant chief chemist and he was assistant marketing manager. And you broke away to set up in business on your own? Yes. You've made substantial losses ever since? We should be in the black before long. Yes, you must have needed a large American order badly. We would have survived without it. Now, how was it, do you say, that Mrs. Stevens came to be in your laboratory? She was posing as a potential client. How did she know the time and place at which to carry out this pose, as you call it? How did she know that you were conducting these experiments? Because we'd informed the British cosmetics industry of the new products that we'd successfully developed for the American market. I see. You wrote round to every British cosmetics firm you could think of, trying desperately to interest them in your new eyeshadow in order to prop up your failing concern. The facts are that Mr. Meatham undertook an extensive promotion in this country. Yes, but surely you knew that Mrs. Stevens worked for a firm that wouldn't have touched your kind of cosmetic with a barge pole. Well, if I'd known she'd held these eccentric views, I should not have invited her in. I see you invited her. I thought you said that she posed as a client. Yes, it was an unfortunate oversight. Indeed. Now tell me, Dr. Ranford, how or why did the mercury blind the rabbit during the experiment? The animal suffered severe corneal damage and hemorrhage of the conjunctiva. It was probably blind. We destroyed it. The blood vessels in the eye started bleeding. That is what hemorrhage of the conjunctiva means, is it not? Well, they're actually minor capillaries, if you want to be accurate. And how about the LD50? How did that kill the rats? The animals died when they ingested about one-tenth of their body weight of the substance. Oh, so the fatal dose for, say, a ten-ounce animal would be one ounce of the li liquid? Uh, roughly, yes. I must admit we were surprised it took so much. Mercury normally has early toxic effects. Yes. What I actually asked was how the experiment killed the rats. Did it poison them? Did it burst their organs internally or what? Well, there were traumatic failures of various kinds in the animals immediately prior to death. Stomach, heart, liver, you often get that. Yes, but could you not say in simple language if what you gave them poisoned them or burst their internal organs? Well, I could explain the etiology of death to a colleague in the field, but I should be reluctant to embark upon it here, I'm afraid. Dr. Ranford, counsel is asking whether the, the general effect that killed the experimental animals was a 
bursting of various internal organs due to pressure, a fairly slow process, or a relatively swift poisoning of the system, such as might arise from, say, um, arsenic or cyanide. Even laymen like myself and the jury can appreciate that distinction. Well, in general, there was no poisoning of the system. The amounts of actual mercury that we used were extremely small, and in consequence, the amount of solution that we had to administer in order to induce death were very large. Death, in fact, followed a disruption of certain internal organs due to pressure from the solution. But it was only when death was induced that we had reliable and unchallengeable proof that the substance was not poisonous. It must be a fairly slow process forcing this amount of liquid into an animal, particularly if it's struggling. Well, nobody's claiming it's a particularly pleasant thing to watch, but it has to be done. Could you please explain once more, Dr. Ranford, if you were trying to assess the poisonousness or otherwise of this solution, why you didn't stop when it was clear that no poisoning effect was occurring? Because we were carrying out an internationally approved test, the LD50, and the purpose of that test is to find out what dose kills half the animals. Well, obviously then, you go on using successive batches of 12 animals until half the animals in any one batch are dead. But I must put it to you, Dr. Ranford, that irrespective of its international approval, this test was clearly brutal and wasteful. You went on taking batch after batch of animals, increasing the dose each time until half the animals in the final test were dead. Now, clearly, you should have stopped when it became apparent that you were dealing with a non-poisonous compound. But it was only when the test was completed that we could be certain that the compound was non-poisonous. And I must repeat my view that the usefulness of the LD50 as an international criterion outweighs any objections to performing it. Very well. Now, if there were 12 animals in this final test, six of them must have died in this extremely painful fashion. Well, the actual pain would have differed according to the activity of the central nervous system, internal trauma, shock, so on. Dr. Other factors. Renford, I can see that as a scientific man you are injured by this prosecution, but you must answer questions in a way that the jury can understand. Now, six, that is to say half the animals died in this way, did they? Yes. In some pain? Yes. Thank you. Now, Dr. Ranford, I'm going to read to you a survey of... Uh, conducted into the practices of six British cosmetics firms. Each were asked whether or not they tested their products on animals in the United Kingdom. Avon, no. Boots, no. Max Factor, no. Woolworth, no. Yardley, no. Elizabeth Arden, no. Now, if reputable firms like these find no necessity to use animal testing, why do you use it? Well, we don't supply these firms. You will have to inquire from them the precise wording of the statements they make and what they actually mean. But what I will say is this. No firm of which I know would put on the market a product which had even the remote chance of being toxic without testing it, if necessary, on animals. They would be mad not to do so. But there are some firms, are there not, that avoid all possible toxic products and therefore any need to test on animals? Some. But why don't you follow their example? Because if people in this country seem to want something different, like they don't all seem to want to become vegetarians. I'm sure they're very wicked, but they, they seem to want more variety. It's called freedom of choice. The free market principle? Exactly. The principle that allows anyone to market his goods, provided they're safe, without any regard for animal suffering that may be involved in testing them. I'm going to read out a list of animal experiments conducted for the testing of what might be uh, termed as luxuries. I'm sorry if the details prove unattractive, but I feel that we should know the kind of tests that lie behind the things we use in everyday life. This is an experiment taken from a journal of cosmetic toxicology, an experiment to test a new kind of food wrapping paper. With three daily doses of the substance to rats, internal bleeding was observed. With dogs, a high daily dose caused frequent vomiting and loss of appetite. Eye irritation tests on rabbits produced extensive swelling and bleeding, the entire cornea was opaque. That test was done to give the world not just wrapping paper, but a new wrapping paper. Do you justify these things? <laughs> Most certainly. It's very important that <clears throat> wrapping paper should not have poisonous properties that get through to the food. <laughs> On a shampoo test, all the rabbits struggled violently and three of the six rabbits screamed on insulation of the product. 
Now, is that suffering worth causing, not just to give people shampoo, but a better shampoo? Are there not already plenty of such products already on the market? Well, if Mr. Vandenberg were allowed to give evidence, I'm sure he'd be able to answer that very effectively. Now, for a food colouring used in flour and sugar confectionery. Four hours after being force-fed to rats, the animal's hair was observed to stand on end, and it was noted that there was a red-coloured nasal discharge in the last hours before death. For cosmetics, test animals included beagles, piglets and baboons. For some species, the cosmetic ingredients proved severely irritant. In others, very severe reactions resembling a chemical burn were observed. Now, Dr. Ranford, is it worth giving a beagle a chemical burn in order to test a new cosmetic? <laughs> well, I have nothing to add. You see, no objection. None of any substance. You don't think it a barbarity to torture vast numbers of innocent animals just to produce a luxury? No, it doesn't strike me that way. You see no force in the argument? None whatever, and I'm surprised you do. I would like just to make one point, if I may. Now, I don't know how many of you registered many of the points that came out in the courtroom yesterday, but most of you probably owe your lives to experiments on animals. You buy the products that the experiments make safe. You elect the governments that encourage the free market and have allowed experiments on live animals for years. Yet, when Mrs. Stevens sees these experiments and complains to the police about them, the whole place goes up in flames. Oh, did you know they were using that stuff on animals? Oh, poor little things. Oh, animals, animals, I never knew that, how cruel. That's what I mean by trying to explain things to a jury of laymen. How on earth do you think we test them? You can't do most of these experiments in a test tube. They don't work. It's animals or nothing. The cases in Fulchester are fictitious. Join us tomorrow when the movement for the protection of laboratory animals versus Ranford and Meatham will be concluded in the Crown Court. Dr. William Ranford and James Meatham, directors of a cosmetics firm, are charged by the Movement for the Protection of Laboratory Animals with conspiring to cause unnecessary suffering to experimental animals in their laboratories. The jury in this trial has been selected from members of the public whose names appear on the electoral register and who are eligible for jury service. They will reach their verdict during the course of this trial on the basis of the evidence that they hear in court. At the start of the third day, one of the defendants, James Meatham, is about to give evidence. You are James Meatham of the Close Fitch James Avenue near Fulchester, and you are marketing director of Vanguard Cosmetics Limited. That is correct. Mr. Meatham, prior to your taking up employment with your present firm, what was your job? I was assistant marketing manager for the British branch of Avsid of New York Limited, the international pharmaceutical house. Dr. Ranford also worked for them. And why did you both leave your posts there? I think we both got fed up working for a stick-in-the-mud firm and reckoned we could do better by ourselves. And your firm, Vanguard Cosmetics, is the result? Yes. Good. Now, in 1974, did you agree with Dr. Ranford the broad guidelines for a series of experiments on animals to be conducted in the laboratories of your new firm in connection with an American order? Yes. And were these tests at the suggestion of the United States authorities? Yes, they were quite firm about it. And what was the order for? Eyeshadow. And what does that do? What is its uh, function? It strengthens and brings out the upper part of the eye. It helps women, and in this case men too, look more interesting. Uh, this is a, a sort of unisex eyeshadow, is it? Yes, it's one of the new ideas we've been pushing in the States. A sort of joint pack for husband and wife. It has uh, mascara, gels, 
and things known as blushers, which accentuate the cheekbones. And eyeshadow, too, of course. Mm, how much is this order worth? Uh, one moment, Mr. Ellis. Is this a so-called um, joint pack containing eyeshadow for men and mascara for women? And if so, are the blushes and um, gels, is it? Are they for women? I'm afraid I haven't quite grasped it. No, my lord, the entire pack is for both men and women. But men don't wear mascara? Uh, my lord, they do in certain parts of the United States. Men of good character? Oh, yes, at dinner parties in California, you quite often see married couples where the man has a hint of makeup around the eyes and cheekbones. It looks very nice. People of standing in the community? Yes, ordinary people. But is it for display or to attract other men or, or for what purpose? Just to look nice, like women use it. I see. Well, this is a point of some significance. You see, the prosecution is saying that this eyeshadow that you are preparing is a luxury. Something that's, uh, well, worn purely for display. It's an important part of their case, and you seem to be conceding that. It's not to conceal scars or by way of trade as a film star or conceivably a, a, a madam might use it. You do see the issue. It's used purely for the sake of appearance, my lord. If it makes any difference to the court's feelings, we're pretty confident that about 90% of these preparations will be used not by men, but by women. Good. Proceed, Mr. Neeson. If I may divert your honour, I was hoping that a witness of some distinction from the civil service would attend to give evidence for the defence. I'm happy to say she has now arrived, and I trust my learned friend will have no objection to her sitting in court until she gives her evidence. Yes, let's get on then. Yes. Now, tell me, Mr. Beetham, did you at any time have any doubts as to whether these tests were necessary? None at all. The American authorities were most insistent. No, I mean generalised doubts, doubts about the morality of the whole thing, whether these tests ought to be performed at all, whether you ought to be exporting eyeshadows, such generalised doubts as that. Never. Yes, why? Because this country's survival depends entirely on exports. Our deficit on the balance of payments last year was around a uh, thousand million pounds, as I recall the fall in the value of the pound and the present rate of inflation are due largely to the fact that we do not sell enough abroad. Mr. Beetham, would it be, if, what would be the effect if we refused to test exports intended for the United States on animals in the way in which they demand? Do you really want to know? Oh, yes. Well, it's inconceivable. I don't know what to say. I suppose you could say that my firm would go broke within a few weeks and the country would soon follow, I expect. I mean... <laughs> You can't play around with people's bread and butter like that. I mean, it's absurd. You have got to sell to live. And if that's what the customers want, then that's what you've got to give them. I mean, it would be economic suicide. I'm sorry, I just not considered anything so outlandish. Well, Mr. Meeson, there's no need to be sorry for placing before the jury the full economic consequences of implementing the programme set out by the prosecution. There can be no case for false sentimentality in this court. Uh, if I could just say something. Uh, you might make it sound as if I don't like animals. Well, I do. I'm very fond of them. I run my dogs in the park every day, or get my manservant to. It's just that you have to balance one thing against another. Yes, indeed, Mr. Meathan. Now, you say you are fond of animals. Now, when you heard Mrs. Stevens describing the rabbit being blinded in the test in your laboratories, what did you feel? I felt sooner a rabbit than a repetition of what happened to Mr. Vandenberg, I'm afraid. Yes. Thank you. Would you please... Uh... Wait, there. Mr. Meatham, uh, I think the view you're putting forward is that the economic interests of this country must be paramount over the welfare of animals. Where they conflict, yes. In effect, the needs of this country for foreign exchange must come first, and animal welfare must be subservient to that necessity. Yes. Have you ever been to Spain? Often. We sell a lot there. Ever seen a bullfight? Yes. Was there a big crowd? Yes. Why would that be? I suppose people like to see a kind of gladiatorial display with an animal being hunted. Yes. Would you introduce bullfighting over here? No. Why? It's not traditional. That's not the reason, is it? It's part of it. Oh, Mr. Meatham, you'd be hounded from morning to night if you brought bullfighting here, wouldn't you? I'm afraid I don't see where this is leading. <laughs> Mr. Meatham, the half-digested economic 
theories that you're offering the court would lead in logic to the setting up of game reserves where wealthy foreigners could come and ill-treat British animals to their heart's content, provided they paid. I mean, you could have Arabs machine-gunning stags in Scotland, a little seal clubbing in Cumbria, and bulls being tormented by visiting American psychopaths in London. I mean, the foreign exchange would come rolling in. It's a ridiculous argument. Yours or mine? Yours. Why? Why? Well... People would never stand for it. How right you are, but that's where your argument leads. Now, do you know what a pit pony is? My lord, I hate to cut short a debate on economic theory, but within the hour, my next witness has to set out for the Palace of Westminster for an urgent debate. My lord, I shan't be long with your permission. Very well. Mr. Meatham, do you know what a pit pony is? Yes, it's a pony that was used down coal mines. I think some of them still are. Do you know why they were taken out of use? I don't know. I expect they got in new machines. Oh, yes, they did. But there were also indignant protests at the savage way they were treated. Would you have opposed those protests? I don't know. Would you have pointed to the British coal export figures and said, no one cares more for pit ponies than I do. My manservant throws them buns every day, but I'm afraid the export figures must come first. I don't think my personal lifestyle has anything to do with this. Why are you in business, Mr. Meatham? To boost the export figures or to make money? Well, partly to make money, of course. Then perhaps you could spare us the cant about the balance of payments. Now, what does eyeshadow do for someone who wears it? Makes them more interesting, better to look at. Does it help your eyes communicate a subtle, inviting new world? Where's that from? From the advertising brochure you send round to the industry, including Mrs. Stevens' firm. Is it true? Well, within the limits of poetic license. Have you blended the mystery of smoke-deepened aquamarine with a hint of sheeny jade to produce spring's most alluring new colour, lambent, limpid green? I see nothing to sneer at in imaginative copywriting. Do the women who wear your prepa preparations become, as you suggest here, remote, detached, aware? And are the men endowed with, if I have it right, a youthful confidence, an assured, almost arrogant poise, a masterful, arresting elegance, a certainty that they're no longer just one more man in a grey flannel suit? If you want to sell rather than sit on your bum in a lawyer's office, you have to get people interested in what you're putting on the market. Mr. Meatham, there are ways of making that point with more courtesy. Is it worth torturing an innocent rabbit to make some narcissistic American woman remote, detached, aware? If you ask the people who work at my factory near Fulchester whether they would sooner be out of a job or making eyeshadow for narcissistic American women, I know what they would say. I'm fed up with the way the idle professional classes of this country patronize and sneer at the businessmen who keep the place going. <coughs> the copywriters who write that advertising, the people who rely on my sales efforts have nothing to do with the torture of innocent animals, and nor do I. No. You just designed the experiments that pump them full of liquid mercury. We've been into that. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Merritt, I think you've made your point. If you've nothing else to deal with, perhaps we could get on to the next witness. I have no further questions, my lord. I call Dr. Kathleen Weatherby. Dr. Weatherby, you are in fact the senior civil servant in charge of experimentation on animals, are you not? As well as being a doctor of medicine. Yes, I did doctoring for years in health. Then I did preventive medicine and now I'm doing animals. If you want the grisly truth, I've been in the civil service 35 years. <laughs> then I'm sure you understand the field we're discussing well. Now, as you probably know, this case involves painful experimentation on animals to test out a new eyeshadow. Now, are such experiments, in general, permitted? Oh, yes. The principal act in this field authorizes experiments to advance knowledge. These experiments would certainly have advanced our knowledge of how mercury compounds react in a cosmetic context. And I might add that Dr. Ranford's experiments in this case had the prior approval of Sir Ian Warburton of the University of Wessex and another distinguished referee Lord Full James, and Mr. Da Costa, who worked with us as an inspector for 20 years, vetted them beforehand. There's nothing hole in the corner about them. So, in fact, but for uh, an irregularity in the wording of the license, Dr. Ranford would never have come before this or any other court. Well, that is unquestionably true. Uh, if I may, Mr. Ellis. Now, members of the jury, 
You will recall Mrs. Merritt explaining at the beginning of this trial that experiments of this kind are indeed normally conducted under a license issued by the Home Secretary under the Cruelty to Animals Act of 1876, and that where such licenses are in existence, these experiments are perfectly lawful. Now, a license was issued in this case, but as a result of an error in preparation, it was found to be invalid, and therefore these experiments are not covered by it. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Weatherby, would you tell the court why you have volunteered to come as a witness in this case? Well, I really just want to emphasize that Dr. Ranford has done nothing which is not being done every month by dozens of reputable scientists. It's most unfair to single him out just because of this slip-up over the license. If you want to reform the law, the proper way to do it is through Parliament. You make the point that a conviction in this case would mean not only the accusing Dr. Ranford in humanity, uh, but of challenging the judgment of two distinguished scientists and an inspector. Something not to be done lightly. Yes. I mean, it seems to me that these people bringing this prosecution are saying one of two things. Either they're saying that testing on animals for luxuries is wrong and that they can define a luxury, or they're saying all testing on animals is wrong. Well, if they're saying the first, of course, they're right up a gum tree because it is absolutely impossible to define a luxury. Is cabbage a luxury? Orange juice? Television? I mean, you can live on bread and water. So that's luxuries. But if they are saying that all testing is immoral, well, then they're not only wrong, but in my view, actively dangerous. Yes, and what do you think of the view expressed by Dr. McKern that testing on animals is wrong because they are living beings with rights, just like humans? No. Well, I think that's pretty pernicious stuff. What this animal lobby fails to realize is that man has only got where he is on this planet by imposing his views and his concepts on the rest of the animals who happen to be around at the time. Well, you may think that I'm a bit of an old cynic, but I think man's values are a great deal more humane and merciful than animals. Of course, it's a debatable point. But I've seen wood ants eating a caterpillar on a laboratory bench, and I'd not like to be that caterpillar. I mean, it's not that animals are unmerciful, it simply is they have no concept of mercy. Once you start dressing animals up in white robes, you are placing them on a level with humans. And once you do that, you are putting a torpedo into the engine room of preventive medicine and medical research of all kinds. Yes, Dr. Weatherby, would you explain what you mean by preventive medicine? Well, rabies is the best example. As you know, you have to kill instantly with whatever means you have any beast that has rabies and kill others to develop the vaccine. I once dropped a rock on a suspected rabid prairie dog in India and then bashed his head in with a club. Of course, I suppose today they would, they'd shoot it because it's less messy, but the principle is the same. Once you allow that an animal's life is any more than a convenience to man, you're on a slippery slope. And successive parliaments have, and in my view rightly, always refused to go down that slope. In other words, you are saying that the experiments performed at Fulchester by Dr. Ranford were in the mainstream of a governmentally approved system that has stood the test of time. Exactly. Thank you, Dr. Weatherby. Dr. Weatherby, do you read the uh, journal of the Metropolitan Police? Oh, no longer, thank heavens. I used to have to. Yes, but uh, you do at any rate know of how police dogs sometimes get killed rather than refuse to leave their masters in the face of vicious criminals. Yes, yes, I once had to destroy a dog that had been injured in a bank raid. Dr. Weatherby, do you really understand, at an emotional level, how close the bond between man and animal can be? Well, I think emotion is often a very bad guide to policy. And people get so appallingly soppy about animals. Yes, but can you imagine how someone feels who has friends among animals when they hear that a dog is being choked to death with face cream? Oh, I don't think people make friends of animals in the same way as they do humans. You've never had any close animal friends? No. Have you ever seen a child cuddle a rabbit? Yes, with some trepidation about fleas and other parasites. So you can imagine how a child feels when he hears that rabbits are being used to test Eyeshadow. Yes. 
And I can also imagine how a mother feels when she finds that one of her children has been blinded by a nasty infection called Canis tropicana, which can be caught from a pet dog. Rabies is not the only disease to be caught from animals, you know. Even children have to grow up and face the real world one day. Yes, Dr. Weatherby, do you think that 30 odd years of being in the civil service, of destroying wounded police dogs, smashing in the skulls of rabid dogs, observing experiments where ants eat caterpillars, all closeness to animal suffering, do you think those 30 years may have coarsened you, may have killed something in you, a capacity to respond as a person to animal suffering, perhaps? Well, I'd say I'm less sentimental about them than I was when I started. But you're not a hard-hearted or insensitive person. I should hope not. Would you flinch at causing a rabbit suffering, severe suffering, if thereby a pint of women's perfume could be safely marketed? Well, I'm in something of a hurry, so I'll just say no. Uh, Dr. Weatherby, this is a criminal case, important to all parties concerned. Please, therefore, allow sufficient time to do justice to the issues. Would you not flinch? No. Suppose it were a question of a hundred or a thousand rabbits suffering so that a pint of perfume could be safely marketed. Well, I really can't answer that. I mean, it's so terribly hypothetical. And, well, anyway, if I may interject, I, I think we are a bit off the point. I mean, the point is that Dr. Ranford, to all intents and purposes, apart from this slip-up about the licence, was operating within a government-approved system. And that is what matters. And the system is a sound one, you think? Pretty good, yes. How many experiments to test cosmetics were done on animals last year? Oh, I don't know. We don't break them down by category that way. How many LD50s are done each year? Oh, well, that isn't reported, are there? How many experiments to test eyeshadow? We don't record that. I see. Tell me then, what is the level of certainty that the experiments conducted by Dr. Ranford had not been performed before in this country? Oh, pretty high. There are, of course, informal consultations. People know what their colleagues are working on. Even in rival firms? Oh, to an extent. I mean, papers are published from time to time. You see, so it is an eminently British informal system of like professional minds meeting casually, perhaps at a conference, to discuss work of common interest. I'm sure you're going to make this sound nasty. But broadly, that is the system. Or, putting it differently, if Dr. Ranford bumps into the right man at a conference cocktail party, his animals may be saved an agonizing death because he discovers that the experiment has been performed before. But if his genial host sears him in the wrong direction, then Dr. Ranford's rats get pumped full of liquid mercury unnecessarily. I think Dr. Ranford would know what was going on in his own field. You're saying there is no watertight system to prevent unnecessary repetition, no general central public register of experiments, for example, but that, uh, in your view, informal contacts are sufficient? Yes. I see. Proceed. Dr. Weatherby, can I try and sum up why you think these tests are necessary? You're not emotionally touched by the thought of animal suffering pain. You, in fact, regard them as not much more than objects to be disposed of at man's convenience. For you, there's really no limit to the pain to which they can be subjected, even to produce a luxury as inessential as eyeshadow. Is that fair? No. You see, I would start the whole argument from a different end. Things have to be safe. And there are recognized tests worked out by the government in cooperation with the scientific community to make them safe. Now, it would be... Folly to have them scrapped by bringing a prosecution of this kind. And that, I think, is the whole point. If this system is as terrible as you suggest, it would not have survived the scrutiny of successive governments. Possibly, Dr. Weatherby. But the system has never as yet been subjected to the scrutiny of a British jury, has it? My lord, if that is the end of substantive questions, I wonder if I might possibly be allowed to leave. I see my assistants signalling that I have to be back at the Palace of Westminster. I have no further questions, my lord. Very well. Now, I will repeat the important points. The accused are charged with conspiracy to do an act or series of acts which are prohibited under Section 1 of the Protection of Animals Act 1911. Now, that act makes it an offence to wantonly or unreasonably do any act which causes unnecessary suffering to any animal. 
Now, a conspiracy is simply an agreement by two or more persons. There's no dispute that the, uh, the tests alleged occurred and that the two accused agreed together to the carrying out of those tests. What is in dispute is whether the suffering was necessary or unnecessary. That is a question of fact and opinion for you to decide. Now, members of the jury, you will now retire, select your foreman, and consider your verdict. Would the foreman please stand? Now, just answer the question, yes or no. Have at least ten of you agreed upon your verdict? Yes. What is your verdict? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Very well. Now, there will be an order that the defence costs be paid by the prosecution. I imagine those costs will be considerable, Mr Ellis. Certainly several thousand pounds, my lord. Well, I'm afraid the movement for the protection of laboratory animals will have to pay. That's the penalty for launching a prosecution which the jury find to be ill-conceived. You're both free to leave this court. <laughs>